Hi, uh, this is Josh Swamidas, and this is Peaceful Science, and I'm here with Paul Braderman. He is a scientist in the in in in, in England. Uh, he uh, worked as a chemist for a long time, but then also got engaged in the conversation on origins. Um, he recently published an article called "Why Creation and Bears All the Hallmarks of Conspiracy Theories," um, which I disagree with him on some parts, which is part of the reason I invited him here. But he's also a friend. Um, uh, I'm a Christian. He's an atheist, and I think we're going to have an interesting conversation today about um, about what creationism is and how to understand it. So, uh, Paul, uh, great to have you here. Uh, do you want to uh, kind of add to that um, to that uh, uh, introduction at all? How, how should people understand who you are and how you fit into this? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I'm not in England. I'm in Scotland. Oh, Scotland! I, There's a difference, right? <laughs> right. Say I'm in England. It's a little bit like calling UK, a text. right? <laughs> It's a sore point at the moment with Scottish independence being Scotland breaking away from the UK being sort of very much on political agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry and, about that. So, um, you know, I'm gonna remember Braveheart. It's uh, it's Scotland. Okay, you're a Scottish professor, um, yeah. in chemistry, but you've been writing about this. If you're 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 emeritus now, you're retired. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the word means, but I've I've been out of paid employment for the past sort of fifteen years now. In fact, but managed to find other things to keep me busy. Yeah, and you're a, you're an atheist, or are you a um, or do you prefer a different term? And are you anti-religious, or do you positive towards it? Like, where do you sit on that whole spectrum? What do I? Are you I religious? I mean, are, how do you feel towards religion? Are you anti-religion? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch the last crucial free word, few words. Anti-religion? Are you anti-religion as an atheist? Or? Oh, oh, certainly not. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely not anti-religion. I don't buy at all the con the conflict thesis, as it's called, has been called, going back over a hundred years now between science and religion. I do have what ought to be in theory. Uh, deep disagreement with those who think it's virtuous to accept things on faith, and I don't. But in practice, oddly enough, this seems to make no difference whatsoever, provided they are as willing as I am to look at evidence and draw conclusions from that evidence. And I also know that religion is extremely valuable to many people. It's a way in which they, I wouldn't say they find meaning, I think they always find meaning within them, but the way in which they have access to and organize them, feeling as a meaning. I've got nothing but nothing but respect for this, provided, of course, this is not a way of evading reality. So let's talk about your article uh, right here. It got, you first published it in the conversation, it got picked up at Snopes, where it got a lot of attention, and eventually even uh, Ken Ham responded to it too, right? Tell yeah. us, um, first of all, what, what do you mean by creationism? Ah, what I mean by creationism, uh, <clears throat> I mean a very, very specific kind of creationism, the creationism which maintains on, which maintains, oh, it's always on the basis of biblical teaching that different kinds of organism, I'm trying to use deliberately ambiguous language, different kinds of organism are the result of separate acts of creation, that it's not possible for one kind to turn into another kind, that everything we know about the ancestry of present species, including, of course, the descent of humans from non-human species, all of this is what creationism in this sense denies. I think- so you, so Are you including old earth creation in there or just young earth creation? Hmm. Sorry? No. Are you including old earth creation like Q-Ross or are you focusing just on younger earth creation? No, I'm no, not not only young Earth. Young Earth creationism happens for historical reasons for now to be the most virulent form. That wasn't true necessarily, but on, over a hundred a hundred years ago. But what young Earth creationism, old Earth creationism, and if you scratch below the surface, nearly all proponents of of this, of intelligent design have in common is this denial that one form can give rise to another in this so way. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I affirm the doctrine of creation. Am I the type of cre creationist you're talking about? 
Well, well, if you're a creationist, in if you're a creationist in the sense that, in the sense that you regard God as the creator of the, of the laws that make them marvelous, proliferation of being things, creator of those laws, and uh, somehow or other in charge of the whole show, I've got absolutely no no. I mean, I don't agree with you there, but I see no. That's not scientific disagreement, and I'm quite happy with that. So you're, what you're really talking about is anti-evolution creationism. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. That puts it very, very succinctly. So then what do you mean by conspiracy theory? Ah, conspiracy theory is a theory which goes against what you might call the generally established consensus of things and ignores the evidence in favor of that consensus by alleging that somehow or other this consensus is foisted on um, foisted on a suffering populace by some kind of elite or people with an axe to grind. So for example, another example of a conspiracy theory would be climate change deniers claim again completely falsely that falsely that climate scientists have somehow or other clubbed together to put together this myth. And exactly the same way, creationists, in the sense I'm using the word, club together to say that evolution scientists are putting forward this myth. Yeah, so you pointed out that there is definitely this sense among some creationists that that the evidence is very clear, but people are somehow holding it back and hiding it from uh, from the from the populace. At least some some creationists say that. Now. Um, Let's, uh, is, is that what your point is? Or why would you say that they bear all the hallmarks of, of a conspiracy theory? What do you mean by that? Ah, yeah, there's several of those. I'll just try and go through those quickly. The first one is making up their, first one is making up their own special rules of evidence. So if you look at answers in Genesis in particular, but also elsewhere, you'll find that they pretend that there's a difference between laboratory science and laboratory science and historical science, I've been accused online frequently of not applying the scientific method, believe it or not, because they redefine the scientific method. Well, this is an interesting point to me because they want to claim that they're just doing science, but if they're going to use different rules than the rest of scientists, I mean, then <laughs> that, that starts to undermine that claim. Both those things can't be true. But regardless, I mean, regardless though, um, they also say, I mean, Answers in Genesis in particular says that they don't consider any evidence valid that contradicts their understanding of scripture, right? Yeah, that's correct. What they do, in, in fact, they, they claim that they accept all the evidence, but they interpret it through a biblical worldview, which means that somehow or other, despite whatever level of inconsistency or absurdity, they regard, they regard what they see as proof of scripture. If All right, so uh, that's one thing. Different standards of evidence. What else? Yeah, they. Yeah, so so rules of evidence. There's 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 what there's there's in that particular case there's invoking a malevolent force behind everything. In their case, of course, the malevolent force is Satan. And Satan seduces people. Evolution is a lie. Satan seduces people into believing lies. Here's this book I know you're familiar with by Ken Ham about evolution called The Lie. And one of the illustrations inside it, which if we were to go into what Ken Ham said about me in greater detail is relevant is, can you get this here? Yes. Yeah, we, we actually discussed that from uh, uh, with Bill Craig, actually. We had a fun time discussing that recently. Um, but yeah, so so there's this idea that they that there is people who are acting malevolently behind the scenes. So whether it be Satan or atheist scientists or, or whoever, and they're actually telling a lie. And that's the title of his book, right? The lie is evolution. Yeah, that's right. And another distinguishing mark is presenting themselves as the persecuted victims. So, in fact, there's this notorious film 
expelled no intelligence allowed which picks up on examples yeah, so of, there's a strong persecution narrative but doesn't it matter if that's actually true i mean surely you must agree that there's at least prejudice against creationists and intelligent design among scientists isn't that true well it depends on what you mean by there's there's prejudice against creationism there's two things here i think you've got a part valid point there's there's prejudice against creationism in the same sense there's prejudice against flat earthism i mean it's just contrary to the facts and at the same time there's um, so, so you, but the point is that there is prejudice if you're if you're a scientist that uh, that ascribes to that you know um there are going to be real difficulties you face in science in the scientific community now i don't think it's necessarily going to destroy your career um though sometimes it has i mean can we at least acknowledge that yeah well there are deep disagreements within the scientific community if they're apart from apart from religiously motivated creationists i don't think there's any serious disagreement at all about the overarching account of <coughs> of developing complexity of life, however it started, of common ancestry, though, so that the linear classification corresponds to historical family relationships. And if you just, if you, if you, so I've got no hesitation of saying that if you deny that, what you're saying isn't true, just as I've got no hesitation in saying that if you pretend the Grand Canyon, if you claim the Grand Canyon, was laid no, no, down. But that's a different issue about, about whether they're right or not. They're, they're claiming to be persecuted. Okay, yeah. I'm just saying that we have to at least acknowledge that there is difficulties for holding those points of view in the scientific community. Isn't yeah, that true? Well, yeah, you know, there are, there always are difficulties inside the scientific community. There always, there ought to be difficulties in the scientific community. A very good example is there was at one point, go back 20 years and quoted in Gust Nature, so quoted by creationist disagreement about exactly what kind of mammals whales were most closely related to and some and some people said one kind of animal some people said another eventually in fact this particular dispute was solved on combination of anatomical and dna evidence so there's no doubt that Whales are most closely related hippopotamuses. What does that have to do? What does that have to do with this point about whether or not they're actually persecuted? I'm confused. I don't. What's the connection? Well, I missed it. So, yeah, I agree. There's a lot of evidence for. I mean, I affirm common descent. I well, think that the evidence is very clear, um, and I think I think that creationists, the way you define them, they're wrong. But that doesn't mean that there isn't any persecution, right? Well, when they. <clears throat> And they, 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 they pick, they pick, they pick notoriously on very small, on very small incidents. They, they claim the right to be. They, they claim, <coughs> essentially, they claim right to equal time. And when they don't get equal time, they claim they're getting less than their fair due. I think that's the essence of it. They also claim the right to. They also claim the right to censor within their own institutions. That's true, and we should talk about that down the line. So I think that there is an imbalance. But they claim the right to censor within their own institutions, while while alleging, I think, very unfairly, that that people people in mainstream and secular organisations are prejudiced against. You can, I don't want to name names, but. I can think of people who failed to get tenure in various institutions because of, simply because of poor output. And creationists say that this is an example of prejudice against creationism. Yeah, well, I would say that um, I think there is prejudice against creationism, but um, but it's probably overstated. And you're right. I think uh, that they actually censor in their own institutions. So it does undermine, uh, you know, some of the some of the complaints they're making. <laughs> but um, let's go a little bit further here. I want to start by with what Ken Ham said about this. Let me pull this up here. Sorry, say the last bit again. I'm going to start with what Ken Ham said about this and kind of get your take on that. So oh, let me just pull it up. It's um, he, he Ken Ham actually responded to you, right? Um, oh, oh yeah, right. Yes. Um, on the Answers in Genesis website. Uh, congratulations. He has yet to write about me yet. Who knows? Maybe that'll happen soon. Um, but um, 
but he 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 really didn't like your article. <laughs> what did you? Yeah. What what are the key points of his response? And uh, and do you and, and do you think he uh, he made a good case against this? Because I would say the place where I I complain. I mean, I, I'm not sure, but I mean, I might. Well, so, so putting up his putting up his thing again. Yeah. Well, there were there were two, there were two valid points he made, which I've quoted. He misrepresented me altogether. I asserted another reason why I say Anson's genesis is a conspiracy theory. It tends to encourage general generally conspiracy theory thinking, so that you'll find Anson and Genesis, Creation Medicine's National Institute for Creation Research, and indeed the Discovery Institute, all buy into the creation and into the conspiracy theory that denies the reality of climate change. And then there's the flat statement that he says nobody in Answers in Genesis has alleged any kind of secret nefarious plot to keep information from the public. And in fact, you come across that kind of thing all the time, accusing me of not wanting creationists to have the opportunity to be heard. On the contrary, I want to have them heard, heard, labeled as such, so that when they're speaking as creationists, they speak as creationists. When they deviate, I know this is sort of anticipating your stuff too. I think creationism should be deeply, deeply closely examined on its merits or the lack of them. Ken Ham then says that I actually begin to defend the notorious Haeckel's embryos. Now, I do nothing of the kind. I say that <clears throat> I say that an example of creationism behaving as a conspiracy theory is picking up on these 1874 embryos all the time as a way of indirectly suggesting that scientists are lying. If I can show you another piece of evidence, this book truth be told, the myth of evolution was actually handed out in a Scottish primary school, Scottish State Primary School. The teachers responsible for that were shown the errors of their ways. That has a whole section on that has a whole section on Heckel. Oh Sorry. Pardon my language. Yeah, so they're, what you're getting at is that there's this example, Heckel's yeah. embryos, where there was really yeah. an error made. It was a long yeah. time ago, and it was corrected. And yeah, there's kind of people are on that, that example as if that demonstrates the whole the whole yeah. endeavor is full of this, where it was actually a corrected mistake. Yeah, well, regarding what I point out in my article, what I stand by is that in what really matters, that in the womb, people have people have gill pouches identifiable as such, hair and a tail, and that there are strong similarities among different kinds of embryo across the vertebrate kingdom at a very early stage, that this is evidence for a common origin. This, this, I, this I stand by, that's true. That's what I said in the article. So picking up on, picking up on Heckel's carelessness, misrepresentation, fraud, whatever you want to call it, the purpose of that is explicitly to suggest utter dishonesty in creationism. I first called creationism a conspiracy theory. But aren't you aren't you now saying that there there's malevolent forces behind creationism? So isn't this a type of conspiratorial thinking? No. Sorry, no, I'm I'm not saying I'm not saying that creationism again. A headline, a headline's a headline and not an essay. And and when I say when I say creationism is a conspiracy theory, actually I'm not quite sure. The more I think about it, the more deeply committed I do feel to that. Because my first response to you was to say, yes, well, individual creationists aren't conspiracy theorists. All I've shown is that creationist organizations are conspiracy theorists. Yet thinking about it, the more I think about it, the clearer it becomes to me, the only way you can continue to accept creationism as we've defined it is to say that I'm lying, National Academies of Science is lying, all the editors of all the journals are lying. No, 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 no. 
So I think most creationists are not actually. So I think you might have a case and for some the most creationists, most young Earth creationists I know, aren't very connected to the to the debate. Are they just they just read scripture? They were in a particular community. That's just what they were taught to believe, and they believe it. And they haven't really experienced uh, directly any reason to doubt that. And that that doesn't make them conspiracy theorists, does it? Yeah, so oh, that, that's interesting. So you're saying that there's a broad range of creationists that you meet who base their creationism on scripture and don't, the reason, but the only the only reason why they don't call me, uh, why they don't call me a conspiracy theorist, me and my, me and those who gave me grants, a conspiracy theorist, is, is because they just aren't really very interested in that particular aspect of it and haven't thought it through. But if they're not aware of the massive scientific consensus in favor of evolution, then they don't, then they won't be troubled by the idea that scientists. Are it's curious. not a gauge, it's just not on the conscious mind. They're not really debating the science of it, they're not reading the journals. They're not, um, I mean, they, they just believe that the earth is young. I mean, I think that's probably how it was for a very long time for a lot of people, too, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing intrinsically about creationism that makes it a conspiracy theory. I think there's something very particular about some of the organizations you choose, but I don't even think that they really represent the the bulk of creationism. Uh, I, no, I think I think it's an I think it's an epistemic that necessarily that necessarily forces forces its adherents the deeper they go into it to become and more become more and more hostile. More and more hostile to scientific results. I just, I just don't see how you can look very closely at a pebble with evidence, in fact, of numerous geological but, events. But it's really easy. You just don't look closely at the pebble. Is the point? If you're not looking closely <laughs> at the pebble, <laughs> right? Okay. You you're not going to. You're not going to have that challenge. So I'm just saying, there's a lot of people that are just not looking closely, right? And that's okay. I mean, that is. I mean, they could be wrong, but I, I think it's a mistake to just call them conspiracy theorists, right? Well, in a sense, in a sense, you're right. It's 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 possible to be a sufficiently uninformed creationist and not a conspiracy theorist, and and maybe even informed but disinterested. I think there's a lot of disinterested people too. Okay, so that's one aspect. The other aspect too, which I think is pretty important is that um, I think a really good contrast is flat earthism versus uh, creationism. So flat earthism has a lot of uh, the aspects of, uh, of conspiracy. I actually think that it is a lot closer to a conspiracy theory. Uh, what is the Flat earthism, if you believe the earth is flat. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, but but the, I think the difference between flat earthism and young earth creationism is that young earth creationism has very strong institutions. There's universities that have belief statements that enforce young earth creationism. There's no example of that with flat earthism, and that makes it very, very different. Well, it's, I, I think I think that, that I think that just just because just because. Certainly, so, you know, of course, universities, institutions, a lot of people, just because this is a major political force inside the United States, this is something you have to live with, something you have to deal with, something you have to find some kind of living with, without, as it were, all-out conflict, because, because that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't help anyone, and that's why I so strongly approve of the entire peaceful science enterprise. But but the fact that institutions, the fact that there are institutions that keep, that insist on creationism, that there aren't any institutions that insist on flat earthism, is a historical accident rather than a deep logical difference between them. Well, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I think this is, there is a difference because flat earthism. I mean. It, all of them are essentially lone wolves. It's not like they're part of a community, a local family community that that is like training up, uh, you know, in homeschool curriculums and you know a full on university system or whatever. Flat Earthism. It's generally lone wolves that will get together, right? 
in the case of uh, young earth creationism, I mean, there's deep traditions that go back over at least, you know, if you, I mean, of course, um, in the current forms, it's very recent, but, but there, but it's at least multi-generational, right? And it, there are strong institutions that are, that are behind it. Um, and I think treating it as if it's just, um, just people kind of thinking crazy stuff on a corner actually really misses what's actually going on in this. I think there's actual systems in place that really encourage and reinforce belief um, in young earth creationism and build trust with people and distrust in mainstream science in a way that doesn't really exist for flat earthism. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm surprised. I'm surprised at that. And, and if you're if you're saying that the creationists, you know, don't really mistrust the mainstream scientists, I, I, I find that. I oh find no, no, that. they do. There's what I'm saying is that there's institutions that are built around distrust yeah. of mainstream science in a way that you don't see for flat earthism. It's uh, and I think I think that that's important. That's an important distinction, right? So. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it, it, it shapes differently what the response should be. So I think, um, I think if, I mean, there are really no flat earth institutions to engage, but there are young earth creationist institutions yes. to engage, right? Yeah. Well, well, <clears throat> we need, we need, we need to, we need to have some way of negotiating with them. They're not going, they're not going to disappear. Their power and influence isn't going to disappear. So, so, so I'm in fact very taken, very taken with the way that you suggest of dealing with them, and I think their response to this has been thoroughly dishonest. They, <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that. Let me just bring everyone up to speed. <laughs> well, so well, I, um, I published a Wall Street Journal article. It's not yet um, public, uh, public yet, but it will be soon. Um, and you may have seen this, uh, some coverage about it. It's actually been in the news quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. But all, actually every article that's come out about it has wildly misrepresented what's in it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What's happening here? I think, there's, I think there's two different things, two things, both bad. One is, and this ties in with my idea of creationism as having persecution, con persecution complex, which again fits in with my notion of it as a as a conspiracy theory, that you're you you want to label the courses and they say you want to label the students. You say that you want courses which are clearly creationist not to be accepted as equivalent to mainstream and equivalent to generally accepted standards of science. And they turn around and say that you want to ban. The create you want to ban students who've had these creations or ban the teaching of it, which is not what I'm doing either, Absolutely. right? No. The, um, the other thing is that at one and the same time, they want to go around. I could quote, I could quote chapter and verse, as it were, from BJU president. They want to at the one and the same time insist that they insist that they teach biology in one particular way, evolution denying, which makes it creationist in the sense we're talking about, and also at the same time to deny you the any authority to label their courses as such on the grounds that there is no such thing as creation science, there's also science. You can't have both those at the same, you can't have both of these at the same time. And in a recent article on, on, on conspiracy theories, which I quote in my article, this, toler this tolerating internal massive contradictions is again another of the signs of a creation of a conspiracy. Theory. Well, maybe. I mean, I think it's more in this case. I think it's actually more about power. Yeah. Than persecution. So um, to uh, oops, here, let's get this right. So. One of the concerns I raised, I raised two concerns. One is, you know, there needs to be transparency about deviations from national norms. And that's just repeating tracks his own policy or creationist yeah, organization's right. own policy, right? Uh, that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing was to give uh, more leeway to dissidents in creationist organizations. It was about academic freedom. Yes. And, yeah, and you make a great distinction between the freedom of institutions and the freedom of and the freedom of individuals. The so freedom of institutions is 
if the institution is big enough to freedom to obey the police. I mean, that's yeah. So this is, I mean, so this is interesting. So there, I said, you know, I'm concerned about people that aren't sure about scientific creationism at Bob Jones University, for example, or at these other universities. And they just, they need to have academic freedom and some protections. And there's been some clear examples that I listed in the Q and A um, to this uh, article where it's, it really does seem like there's been abuse, right? Yeah. And it's not even just for people that affirm evolution. I, I, I raised one example of Bill Dembski. Bill Dembski is an ID supporter. Yeah, it is an academic freedom. Let's see if I can straighten myself out a bit better. No, sorry. This isn't, it isn't academic freedom, it's, it's academic slavery. I mean, not yeah, only so that, like if a person <laughs> in, in any of these young earth creationist institutions that were not actually founded on young earth creationism, to be clear, because young earth creationism wasn't part of fundamentalism in 1927 when Bob Jones was founded, right? Um, you know, the, if a professor there now comes out publicly as a, I mean, they're not, they, they can't come out with any. Uh, disagreement with young earth creationism without, you know, according to the president of BJO, they'd be fired on the spot. Yes. Well, and so then that wouldn't happen at a secular institution. I mean, I we know of many young earth creationists that are hired as faculty at universities. I do, and some of them are public young earth creationists. Are they fired? I mean, are you even allowed to fire? And, I mean, I know how it is in the United States. There would be lawsuits involved if you fired a person because they were young earth creationist. Are you allowed to even do that in England? Yeah. Well, in a secular institution, it, I was, I was, I was, a, I was a, I was a departmental chair, and I was very aware of the very well aware of the rights and protections of faculty members. Sometimes inconvenienced me as chair, but it was a good thing that I was inconvenienced. The mm, the, the, the idea, if if you, the idea of firing anyone because of their beliefs would be anathema in 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 any what I would call an academic, intellectually open institution. I, think I mean, it's, it's notable too that many of the cases of uh, of persecution that are talked about for ID and young earth creationism. Now, to be clear, I do think that there is prejudice, and I do think there has been consequences. So, I'm not trying to say that it isn't there. But in almost all of those cases, they're still employed at secular institutions. Yeah. I don't know of any example um, in these young earth creationist contexts where they have tolerated a person that affirms evolution, right? Or affirms an old earth. Like, that's not really tolerated, right? Right. Indeed. Whereas, <clears throat> for, for example, Michael B., I don't know whether we call him a creationist or not, is an interesting borderline case. Not only is he not fired, but on the basis of not very many papers, and I'm sure even fewer grants, but probably excellent teaching and long service is probably a lovely guy to be around. It was, it was not not many not fired, but he was created. He was promoted full professor. Yeah, and he got. Um, he has. A, I'm, I'm not a full professor yet, um, but the, what's important, I mean, is that you know he. You know, he's even treated respectfully by people in his department, and people disagree with him. And but, you know, tolerating person doesn't mean agreeing with their ideas. But I do think there's been actually quite a bit of tolerance of Michael uh, Behe, even though people strongly disagree with him, and are often, I mean, I would say maybe even rude or upset with him. I mean, that's not ideal. I mean, I think there is a prejudice, but I think the point is that. They don't keep him around because they like him. They keep him around because they have a fairness about it, right? Yeah. Let me tell you about a little incident that may, may well shock you. This was at the University of North Texas when I was talking to an administrative colleague in the administrative building. We were surrounded not by academic staff, but by organizers and secretaries and that sort of thing. And I was, I was talking about something. He asked me to keep my voice down when talking about creationism, talking about evolution, because some of the people around there were very, were very religious. I, and then after the conversation, I sent him a non-apology, saying that it's absolutely absurd not to talk about, not to express your views, frankly, in a university of all places. But what is 
I, I think, like I said, I think it's important to recognize, though, that there is difficulty if you're a creationist in a secular institution. Like another example that gets po pointed out is I forget the guy's name right now, but uh, there was a creationist, I think, lab tech or, or a research scientist that uh, found the Triceratops horn and it kind of and, and with the soft tissue in it. And, um, you know, he was like fired from the university um, for his job because of that. He won a he won a settlement. It wasn't a lawsuit. There was a there was a legal um, you know challenge made to that. Um, there's protections uh, for that. Um, what happened with him was wrong. It should he shouldn't have been fired for that. And he I think got to a two hundred thousand dollars settlement because of that. When people realized, yeah, we we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know, I don't know whether particular Armitage in... Mark Armitage is his name. That's the guy. Yeah, I don't know whether this particular individual was rightly, rightly or wrongly fired. As you say, he had redress. He, university needed to show due cause. And since the guy eventually lost his case, the guy I'm thinking of lost his case, the university had shown due cause. Oh, no, in yeah. this case, they didn't go to court because they settled. That means that he had a case. I mean, oh, he had they, a case. No, they, they settled out of court. Oh, yeah. And this again, this again is an interesting, interesting fact about the United States that sometimes it's the correct, the clever thing to do, the only sensible thing to do, I should say, is to settle out of court, even though, even though you know you're thoroughly in the right. Well, and, it avoids and, a lot of expense and time. But the point is, I think that he, I mean, he look when you look at the, the facts of the story, it really does seem that it was unfair. But the fact of the matter is that it's because it's a secular institution. There's actually rules there. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah, um, right. But on the contact and contrast, uh, there's been several people who have lost jobs at creationist institutions uh, with unfairly applying and interpreting belief statements, often retroactively, uh, and and they and they don't have the same redress. And that's that's yeah. an issue where you know it's not you know if, if the concern is really academic freedom, we should be concerned both about the younger the uh, abuse of younger creationists that might happen in a secular institution. And the abuse of the centers of young creationism that happen in you know in creationist institutions. It should be really both those things that we're concerned about, right? I absolutely agree there, and this is very very interesting because the professor signing up signs a contract, and you can look at that contract, and if the contract says he can be fired for, fired for what is thinking, then or for fired for his beliefs, then. <coughs> That's a very good reason for not accrediting the institution at all. And this, I think, is a point that should be made in public discussion. Well, you do make it, in fact. And well, I do think that, um, you know, we, so we have the First Amendment here in the United States. It has, a, it has a rule called the freedom of association. And so I do think that there is good legal. And I think it's frankly a good thing that organizations are allowed to have belief statements in certain contexts. Um, and I think a Christian university is one of those where we should tolerate belief statements, even if we disagree with them. But uh, the issue is that those belief statements have to be applied, applied fairly. You can't have a belief statement, hire a bunch of faculty, and then change the belief statement, and then fire all of them that won't affirm that now. That, that's not fair. Yeah. That, that's like breaking a contract, frankly. It's okay. not keeping your word. And it's actually done in pretenses to say, this is what the purpose of the institution is. It's always been that way. But reality, it's not what it's always been. It's been a change that was done, and it's a power play. Yeah, I think this happened in Bryan, didn't it? it happened Bryan. in Bryan. It happened at BJU, at Bob Jones University, <laughs> and several others. And a lot of it was actually provoked uh, by uh, the tenets of creation by Ken Ham. So in 2014, uh, yeah. several colleges signed on to Ken Ham's uh, tenets of creationism, or tenets of creation, which commits them to young earth creationism. Um, and he tracks whether or not, I think there was four different groups. I mean, I, I know three of them. One is if the president signs it, if the chair of biblical studies signs it, and if the chair of science signs it. Yeah. And at several of these institutions, they did, uh, they started making changes to their belief statements and start taking a harder line on earth creationism to kind of get the bona fide accreditation from um, Answers in Genesis. Well, this is, this is, as you say, breaking a contract. Some of the professor signs up. Under one set of XR, under one set of conditions, not many expectations, but conditions stated in a legally binding document. And these conditions are then changed during their tenure. And, and, and the change is used against them. I'd have thought that a professor in that situation 
would have a very, very strong case against the university for unfair dismissal and breach of contract. Well, what it really does, though, I mean, um, you know, from what I understand, um, most of the, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of complexity. I don't want to get into all of it here. Um, you know, most of them might actually actually have those beliefs there. And that's fine, too. I mean, I think part of that happens. But then what happens if they change their belief? I think what it does is it creates a very hostile environment where uh, how do you even have a conversation with, uh, how do you have like a sensible conversation with another scientist whose job depends on rejecting your point? Yeah. Well, I mean, and then, does, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, um, well I think it would be, well, I think it would be un unthinkable to, as a, unthinkable to report a scientist that um, scientists I disagreed with or something. Mm -hmm, to, to, yeah, same, same one. Same one of my chemistry. Same one of my chemistry colleagues who turned out to be a flat earther, and I then reported them to the university head for being a flat earther, and they were fired. That'd be utterly outrageous. If one of your colleagues do that, would you stand up for that guy and say it was wrong to do that? Well, sorry. If one of your colleagues outed a flat earther in your department and tried to get him fired, would you stand up for him and tell them that that was wrong? Yes. 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 The freedom. <clears throat> either people, either people are free to um, free to express their express their views, however outrageous, short of action, short of inciting violence, or they're not. Now, that that's just expression of views. What happens in the classroom, of course, is slightly different. Is well, slightly different. If I happen to believe that helium was highly reactive. And as a matter of some weird deep principle, and or that the only thing that held hydrogen atoms together was the force was the will of hydrogen molecules together was the force of God or something like that, and I taught that in chemistry classes, then I should indeed be sacked for incompetence because I'm not. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not teaching the subject as it's reasonably reasonably understood. And I think also in a second. Well, I mean, it's important to point out that in my um, in my um, my article here, I wasn't arguing that they shouldn't teach creation science. I just thought they should make it clear when they do. So yeah. I wasn't even saying that they shouldn't teach creation. I was just saying that you know when you do, you should be clear about that and disclose it and be transparent. As I mean, it seems pretty sensible to do that. Um, and not not to label students, not to track students, but to be clear about where 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 courses don't match what everyone else is doing. Yeah, I absolutely I, I absolutely agree. One thing was written by a colleague, I think someone I think someone we both know, who said that this person, this professor, would have failed a student who answered questions about evolution correctly and then wrote at the bottom that she didn't believe a word of it. On the grounds that that would show lack of proper understanding. Now, I, I, that I think, was wrong, and all of us stepped up and said that's absurd. That's, that's absolutely and totally wrong. They showed competence and mastery of the subject, and competence and mastery of the subject is what they need to show in order to pass the course. And I think I think this is actually a point that's a little bit hard for people to understand in the Christian community. Like in, in Christian community, rightfully, I would say, we care about what people believe personally. But one thing that's important about the scientific community is that we don't actually care what people believe personally. We, we don't. I mean, in fact, most scientists, you just don't know what they believe personally. All you know about is their work. Yeah. Yeah. And I just keep on coming back to the, to the creationists wanting to have it both ways, wanting to say simultaneously they're teaching mainstream science and also to restrict what that science is. So that much more than even the most intolerant of mainstream scientists, they're defining science to fit their own rules. I came across a gem, in fact, recently, Announces in Genesis, which was rejecting evolution for hominid, they, she said, evolution. And she could immediately tell it's wrong because it failed the first test of accuracy. It disagreed with the Bible. Now, she cannot do that and also say that she's examined the scientific evidence because she's refused to examine the scientific evidence. Just ruled it out of court. Yeah, and, and that's okay. I mean, I think in the end, 
Um, my real intent is, I, mean, I think the fact of the matter is that as Americans, at least, and I mean, certainly more broadly too, we're going to disagree about important things. Um, and there are always going to be young earth creationists among us. I don't think that the solution is going to be that we convince everyone to agree with us. And I think that that's okay. The question is, how do we work together? And I do think that individual dialogue is important, but also we have to be thinking about institutional changes too, to make sense of this. And that's a difference, a very big difference, I would say, between understanding creationism as a conspiracy theory versus creationism as an institution. Well, I think that the kind of opposition you've come up against, your extremely sensible, sensible suggestions, points out, in fact, the resemblances between creationism and other conspiracy theories, that you're misrepresented, you, they copy each other's lies about you. They confuse intellectual points with personal attacks. They hold simultaneously mutually inconsistent beliefs, and it's about power. Well, I do agree it's about power, and I do agree <laughs> with that description of a lot of the coverage, though I will say that... Um, uh, most of the news outlets I've reached out to to point out that, you know, what they were saying was not true. They have corrected it, which is good. Um, so I think that also shows some of the limits of how far that type of manipulation goes. I mean, it'll work on certain websites that are really devoted to creationism, but as soon as it gets out of that world, I mean, journalistic ethics kicks in and people aren't actually wanting to libel one another. I mean, they're going to, they're, they're backing off of some of those claims. So that's good. But then, I mean, it's been a good conversation, Paul. Um, there was one question that came up. Um, I'm curious what your take is on it. And we'll also be doing some videos on this too, Mario. There's this question. I'm curious how you would answer it. Um, we've been talking a lot about, um, uh, we've been talking a lot about, uh, about creationism right here, but he wants to know what are your thoughts on human cloning, artificial intelligence, and other recent advancements in the scientists that Christians should know about? What do you think Christians should be paying attention to and learning about right now? And what should be they, they be uh, tracking and reporting to one another in the sciences and caring about beyond creation? Well, it's not for me to tell Christians what to do, since I'm not one. Oh, but we're I, just asking, like, what are the cool stuff we should look at? What is the stuff that we should be concerned about? Um, it's an invitation that human, human cloning I'm very, very suspicious of. I should imagine that, I mean, imagine who, imagine who would get access to cloning first. Also imagine what it would be to grow up knowing yourself to be a clone. This is such a, so great an innovation and so great an intrusion on ordinary human life as we know it, that, I, that, I see no justification that we've got enough people. We know that. We've got enough people. The idea, the idea that some people should choose to clone themselves or choose to be chosen to be cloned, I think this is completely inaccurate about what kind of things people are. People develop. They're not just, they're, they're not just their genetic makeup. AI, again, I'm very, very worried indeed about AI. The other day I got an ad popping up for me for cheap cremation source services in Glasgow. Now, whoever is choosing my ads knows that I'm of an age and possibly also a disposition to be interested in cheap non-religious cremation services. I don't like people knowing that much about me. Mm. I go on much more serious. I go on Twitter, I go on Facebook, I find I find that I'm talking to people. Twitter automatically feeds to me people who use the same keywords as I do, have the same concepts as I do. Facebook, again, very much the same kind of thing. So AI is driving us all the time into... into so you're, not, you're, you're concerned about how AI is really shaping society and the connections we have with one another. That's yeah. a really good point. What are, what are some of the most in interesting and exciting uh, recent advancement in science that, that you think we should be thinking about? Well, I don't know, the most interesting, the most the advancements in science that I would like to see are advancements in helping people to think clearly. And yet I fear that the people who are doing most work very effectively about what influences people are those who want people to think as unclearly as possible. 
Well, uh, so it's about how to think clearly about things. I think that's that's true. I think, hey, I think the stuff in Human Origins has been really interesting lately. Uh, we had uh, the we had the Neanderthal brains in a bottle. We had uh, the guy from um, Morotri who came and talked about how they crispered into a human cell line uh, Neanderthal genes and saw what uh, what the cell line the, when they were transformed into neural cells if they were different or not. That was pretty cool. Uh, that's something I, I that's, a, that's something out of science fiction. I wouldn't have expected to see that. Um, you know, when I was an undergrad, that this is something I get to be able to talk about. That's pretty cool, right? Sorry, that's pretty interesting uh, stuff, right? Um, there's happening in human origins research, but it's fine. I mean, maybe our origins of life are enormously so. Well, origins happening? of humans, but origins of life is another one too. We could be talking about. I mean, I guess it's a little bit hard to answer your question, Mario, because there's honestly so much cool stuff out there in science. I mean, uh, and I'm kind of springing this question on Paul right now, so it's a little bit hard to answer. I have one last question for you, Paul, um, before we uh, before we uh, end this. Hey, I think that God created everything through an evolutionary process. If they come for my job and they want, if and if people are trying to report me, are you going to stand up and protect me? Well. I absolutely. I mean, if if you if we were to teach in class that in class that God created everyone, then since you're a state-funded institution, you will be breaking. You'll be violating the constitution. Uh, it's a private institution. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, you're a sorry. You're a private. You're a private institution. I don't know. I would. I would say in that case, you sincerely, you sincerely believe. Look, I mean, that's a different issue. I don't think that I'm concerned about how power is used. If I was a professor, I don't actually talk about my beliefs very much to my students if they report to me because I don't want them to feel ever forced to engage with my beliefs. They, they, I only want them to come if they want to hear it. So I don't yeah. do it in courses. Yeah, they ask you. They ask you tell. That's fair enough. If, uh, if you, but if you, but if you were to sort of require people to produce arguments in favor of why God is in charge of everything as part of part of the course, that would be a completely different matter. I mean, also it may or may not be appropriate. For example, I think that incomes are much too unequally distributed in our societies. If I were to start talking about that at any length in chemistry class, then I would quite rightly. Be criticised for going off topic into matters both controversial and irrelevant. So, again, it, so it, it depends. It depends exactly on how you talk about. It. You have absolutely every right, if it's appropriate, and if you're asked, it's certainly appropriate. To turn around, declare your belief in God, declare your belief, if you like, in genealogical Adam and Eve, even though even though that's something that most scientists would, most evolution scientists would find rather strange point of view. I would certainly, I would, I would, I would stand up for you. I'd argue for you. I'd march on behalf of you. I promise you that. Well, thank you. Um, well, that's what I love, honestly, about how academic freedom is supposed to work. You don't have to agree with a person to really uh, advocate for their right to to be there, right? That Absolutely. doesn't give them a right to teach anything they want. It doesn't give them a right to uh, to to have equal time or anything like that. But there is real protections that come from it. All right. Thanks a lot for coming and talking. Uh, it's a great, great to actually meet you in person. Uh, we've interacted a bit over uh, email over the last year. And thanks for coming and, and telling us about why you think creationism is a conspiracy theory and letting me tell you why I think you're wrong. <laughs> Any last thoughts before we close? Well, just this has been an extre extremely interesting conversation. You don't like the idea of creationism as a conspiracy theory, and you've got you're partly right in this because that implies that I'm seeing inside people's minds and you know <laughs> the minds of some of these people better and more sympathetically than I do. Well, in the end, sympathetic <laughs> is good. We are peaceful science and, you know, we're trying to build trust with the public and trust is what's really on short supply and we're going to do well. So thanks a lot for coming, Paul, and thank you for listening in. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you in the future. And yeah, we're going to be talking more to actual scientists. Uh, this is what uh, Mario says. Because he wants, he uh, wanted to hear actual scientists explain these issues to Christians in a respectful way. That's exactly what we want to do. So thanks a lot, guys, and we will talk to you later. <laughs>